All righty. Thanks everyone so much for joining. I know um, we have a couple more people coming in, um, but we will get started for the, for the sake of time and sake of keeping things on track. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name's Elise Trolligan. I coordinate the BWAT program here in the Chesapeake region. Um, and we're excited to be featuring some of our BWAT grantees during this um, winter session of our webinar series. Um, so many of you know, this is a series that we've run for the past couple of years. Um, we have a number of um, webinars that are coming up this winter in addition to this one. Um, Maggie will drop a link into the chat. Um, so just a quick preview, we have an elementary MeWe um, focused webinar um, with our partners from Shore Rivers on January 25th. We have one on, Jan on um, February 22nd with Virginia Commonwealth University. They'll be sharing about um, modules that engage secondary students in um, bivalves in their ecosystems, a really cool approach um, that uses some um, kind of, you know, uh, role playing in the classroom. And then on March 22nd, we'll have um, a really unique partnership um, that we'll be showcasing with two universities and two school districts and how they're working to build capacity both in pre-service teachers and in systemic um, sustained MIWIs in, in a school district. So really, really exciting. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we dive in. This webinar is being recorded. Um, because of that, please keep your camera off um, unless you consent to having your image potentially included in the recording. Um, at the end, we'll have time for discussion where you can come off uh, mute and turn your video on, and I'll just chop that out of the video so we don't have to worry about that. Um, the recording will be posted on the Bay Program's YouTube page. Um, we have a Miwi Practitioner channel. Usually it takes a couple weeks to get up there, um, but you can find that um, on that link, which I'll share out in a couple of minutes here. And um, we will have time to kind of pause for some questions throughout this session. Um, so if you have questions that come to you, just pop them in the chat. And myself and my colleague Maggie will be pitching them to Ann and Bess today. Um, and yeah, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, these two fine folks. So both Ann and Bess are amazing, amazing educators from um, Howard County Conservancy. They're working, I would say, at the cutting edge of um, bringing climate change education into both the classroom and the after school space. Most of their presentation today will focus on that um, in, or that uh, you know formal education space, but uh, definitely hit them up if you have questions about what that looks like for a student leadership program or something like that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne to kick us off. Great. Good afternoon, folks. It's great to see you. Thanks for the intro, Elise, and thank you for the opportunity to share our story. Um, our NOAA BWIP program is called Climate Knowledge. And it is, we started this program systemically through our sixth grade in Howard County Public Schools in Maryland. And it's called the Student Research and Action to Reduce the Climate Change Emergency. So this is a three-year grant. And we are, uh, we piloted the grant last year with three middle schools. We have a total of 20 middle schools in Howard County. And this year we're up to 13 middle schools. So next year will be our third cohort and we'll be at um, full systemic status. So we're excited to be here this afternoon with you. We're excited to share our story. This is actually the first time that we've been able to kind of tell it from start to where we are now. So thanks for being here with us. And we do appreciate feedback and any questions and comments that you might have throughout this talk. So what's interesting is that what we started out with is not where we are now. And uh, so it's really become this intra-generational learning about climate change in our community, which is super exciting. So um, I've been teaching here as a climate educator and environmental educator in Howard County for 23 years. And um, what I'd like to do next is to hear a little bit about you and you know where where you if you're a teacher if you're an informal educator or formal and uh, tell us where you're calling in from and and tell us how you plan to relax during this upcoming holiday okay well welcome folks i know some of you logged on and did an introduction I appreciate um, just hearing where you're from. And I see there's a lot of folks from Annapolis today. Aaron and Megan, welcome. Great. Aw, playing with your new pup. That sounds so much fun. 
Well, again, uh, we we do. We're really glad that you're here, and we're going to be just asking for your thoughts on um, climate education and if your organization is working on it. So this will be a great a great time. Great, thanks everybody. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we are calling in from the Howard County Conservancy. It's a north, northern part of Howard County. We're located in between Washington and DC. And this land is um, 232 beautiful, beautiful acres um, featuring several different types of micro ecosystems. And we just happened to have a bird walk this morning with Bonnie. Ott, and she told us all kinds of interesting things about the land that we didn't know. For example, um, this is one of the best kept secrets for bolus spiders. Um, and there's rare birds that are found here in one specific location, this, this like, small little wetland area, and also home to the rare red salamander. So every day we're learning, as, as I'm sure you are. So in any case, um, the Conservancy has been working on um, education with the Howard County Public School System. So we'll talk about our partners next. Uh, we have some wonderful partners supporting our work. So obviously our big partner is NOAA. And not only did we receive funding for the NOAA BWEP, but they are truly our partners in that there's a constant dialogue of, oh, I'm running into a problem. Can you help? Or do you know someone who can give a climate justice talk? Or can I just get feedback on this activity? I'm just really, I'm really unsure of of how it's going. So that kind of true partnership is so appreciated. And then of course the Howard County Public School System, you know, a few years ago we went to them and we said, listen, we are really interested in pushing forth a climate ed program systemically. Um, how do you feel about it? And they said, okay. I said, well, which grade would you like to go with? And we were told sixth grade. So right from the get-go, we have been able to have an end goal of systemic education. Live Green Howard refers to our Howard County Office of Community Sustainability. They are fantastic partners. They partner with us by providing guest speakers for teacher professional development. Um, and they also provide a contest for schools. And it's uh, it's a, the students have to fill out a tree application. And whichever application gets picked out, they bring over 50 trees and they plant with the students. So it's just, I mean, who can ask for more than boots on the ground action work? Um, our local NAACP, they come in to support us reviewing particularly our climate justice work, our stations. They're working on bringing volunteers to our space to help out with field trips. Uh, climate Gen, I'm curious um, if you could show me in the chat if you've heard of Climate Gen before. Um, some of you may have attended, um, you could just say yes, no. Um, some of you may have attended their big summer program. Okay, if you haven't, if you haven't tapped into Climate Gen, um, check it out. Their newsletter is excellent. It comes out, I'm thinking about every three weeks, every four weeks, and invariably there's one little nugget that I find super useful to what I'm doing at that particular moment. So Climate Gen is helping us to review the curriculum. They've been really great about helping us add in opportunities for student reflection, as well as tools in the curriculum. So just, I can't say enough about that organization. University of Maryland, um, in particular, Dr. Sarah Vaya, she is our local Howard County expert. And she is amazing. She's in her mid seventies. She just keeps going with her research. It is incredible. She puts together a series of summer webinars for the whole community. And she started with like 100 followers. Now she's up to 900 followers for the summer. And more information can be found at um, www.climatecorner, I think it's .org. And Bess, maybe, maybe you can remember more than I can. So um, give her a follow, check her out. Her programming is, is first class. So just like any teacher would, we're going to start out with a quiz. Um, I recently read a great article from Brookings. And so I'm going to pose this question to you. Recent research shows that if only 16% of high school students in high and middle income countries were to receive climate change education, we could see a nearly blank gigaton reduction of carbon dioxide by 2050. What is your answer, A, B, or C? Oh. 
Okay. So we've got some Bs, Jamie B, Megan C, Don B, um, Adrian A. All right. Well, the answer is C. Isn't that incredible? And that really shows that like, yes, planting trees and action projects are excellent. It's part of the whole solution, but the, the climate education is a really invaluable part of the solution as well. All right, one more quiz, one more quiz question. In the United States, what percentage of parents support teaching climate change education in schools? Okay, Leslie saying C80, Miranda B75, Carrie A, mm -hmm, Diego A. Well, if you circled C, you are correct. So we have we have a lot of support around the country to teach this kind of work. The answer probably five years ago, 10 years ago, was probably lower than A. I don't have any research to support that, but just from personal experience, I could say that. All right, so I'm gonna hand over to Ms. Best for the next part. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Bess Kaplan and I work here at the Conservancy. I have been involved in informal science education for almost my entire career, so that's going on a ways now. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this curriculum that we've developed for our sixth graders. So um, the Climate Knowledge Program really started out um, with this longstanding partnership that we've had with the Howard County Public School System, and, and Anne mentioned this briefly. But about a decade ago, the school system recognized the need to develop really high quality environmental education for students in their school system. So rather than take on this task kind of in the central office, they decided to partner with the Conservancy and they placed a teacher um, at the Conservancy full time to develop environmental education programs for students. And so when we came to them uh, with this idea for developing climate change curriculum, we had this great relationship already going with the school system. And that's really thanks to this kind of really great partnership with, with Anne, actually, who is their school system teacher that works here at the Conservancy. So um, we had this level of trust with them. They really wanted to partner with us. And they did feel like teaching climate change systemically was a very high priority. So how did we do this? Well, we didn't have to start from scratch. We took an existing existing unit on weather that all sixth graders learn, and we modified that to include climate change and climate justice. And we continue to meet all the sixth grade science standards. And we also relied a lot on our teachers to help with the curriculum writing. Um, and, and slides here. So the curriculum very closely follows the MIWI process. That was obviously important to NOAA to, to fund our project, um, but also we saw the importance of following this process to help the kids really go from understanding climate change to these outdoor field experiences where they're collecting data, analyzing that data, and then coming together as a class and determining what kind of action projects they wanted to take. So I want to just show where this unit fits into everything else sixth graders learn in Howard County. Um, and I do want to point out that we have been given the most days of any other unit, and we really, really fought for that. We had to still meet those standards of weather and climate that kids were always learning, but adding in enough time to teach climate change and climate justice, which are Tricky topics, especially for sixth graders. These kids are still young and their ideas are very informal in general. And we really needed enough time for them to, to learn and understand some of these concepts. So um, this is a very, sixth grade is very much an earth science, uh, earth space science year for these students. So the schools that are in our pilot program this year, they're, third unit is our climate change unit. Uh, the other schools that aren't in the program yet are still teaching the old weather unit. Next school year, all 20 middle schools 
in Howard County will teach the climate knowledge unit and the weather watch unit will be um, retired. Okay, so just a question for you all. If you could in the chat share what you think the most important climate change topics are for sixth graders. What do you think sixth graders should know and understand about climate change? So Craig says climate justice, solutions, how they can help. Urban heat islands. the local connections, that students can make a difference, biodiversity, humans, why it's important, why it matters to them, impact of large storm events. I love all of this. The most important thing to do about right now is talk about it. Yeah. Jobs opportunities to act. So these are all great answers. Um, and I'm going to share with you what we actually have in the curriculum right now. So Anne mentioned this is a three-year project. We are in year two. So year one, we piloted some new uh, lessons and activities. Year two, which is this current school year, we've really dug into this unit and made some very, very big revisions. And so this is where things stand as of now. We have one more year left in the project. So there will be another iteration of the curriculum after we get the feedback from teachers this school year. So here's our unit question. How are individuals and communities impacted by severe weather events differently? And how might they understand and mitigate these events? Um, so we have four learning sets. So basically the unit is broken into four different sections. The first learning set is very much your traditional weather and climate. Um, the types of weather, the differences between weather and climate. Kids learn about earth systems, the water cycle. So we're setting them up for understanding how these different kinds of weather events occur, um, different climates, how weather and climate are related and how they are different. The second learning set, how are Earth systems impacted by climate change? This is where we begin to teach them about the greenhouse effect, human impacts on weather. Um, they learn about global weather patterns, and then they look at how climate change is affecting those patterns. They also dive into severe weather events and how climate change is um, changing the frequency and the severity of severe weather events. And they end the second learning set by looking at climate justice around the world. So they're looking at um, uh, global climates, and then they're looking at how residents in different parts of the world are being impacted by some of these severe weather events that they've that they're learning about. So learning set three, is really our climate justice learning set. So our driving question here is how and why are some communities impacted disproportionately by the consequences caused by climate change? So the students start out looking at microclimates in the schoolyard and they kind of um, expand out uh, to looking at different communities uh, nearby, we use uh, Baltimore and DC as some examples because uh, where we are located is right between those two major metropolis areas. So the kids are very familiar with those locations. Um, we, we talk a lot about urban heat island. We talk a lot about flooding. These are two of the major issues that kids in our area, people in our area are going to face. Um, and so we focus on those events and look at local examples of flooding and of heat stress across communities. And finally, we have a whole section, the last section of the unit is focused on mitigation and adaptation strategies. So what can communities do? What can people do? Uh, what can the students do? What can their school communities do, their neighborhoods? What can Howard County do? We look at state, how the state is adapting to climate change. And then we also look at the global communities to see kind of across the globe, what communities are doing to adapt to climate change. 
just some uh, curriculum highlights that I pulled so you guys can see some of these really key climate change topics that we've included in the unit. So the kids look at the Keeling curve. Um, that is, uh, you know, kind of the basis for understanding and, and evidence for seeing how carbon dioxide has increased in our atmosphere over time. Um, climate justice, we use some different tools to help them, first of all, understand how in, uh, communities are impacted disproportionately, and also to help them kind of work through how they're feeling about this material. So we use something called the Dallas ISD Moon Meter, um, which will provide the link for you all. Um, and that's just the way the kids can, as they're learning about these different topics, some of the topics could be upsetting, for them to kind of pinpoint like, okay, I'm feeling this way about this. Um, and we use Dallas ISD kind of throughout the unit. They also do a game based on the limited resources game where different communities have different resources to start with. And then the community is um, hit with a severe weather event, either uh, extreme temperatures or flooding. And the kids kind of have to work through this, these scenarios where depending on how many resources they have, how does their community fare at the end of the game? So as I mentioned before, we use Urban Heat Island in Baltimore and DC as some of our local examples. And then uh, if you're at all familiar with Howard County, uh, you may have heard of Ellicott City, which had two really horrendous floods, one in 2016, one in 2018. Um, and this is something that the kids are fairly familiar with. And so we do use that as an example of, um, of these intense storms and um, what can happen when communities are faced with flooding. The kids also have an opportunity to use some mapping tools. Um, these tools, they can pull up their own community or they can pull up where their school is located and see some different information about their community like the tree equity score uh, or how much access their community has to parks. Okay, so... Um, one of the other elements of the curriculum that we ask the students to do is to go out with an adult in their household and to walk their community and look for how their community is responding to climate change. So they have um, a Google form that they fill out and we've listed for them some of these ways that we know in Howard County, the community is responding to climate change. And this is just another data point that teachers can use in the classroom when the kids are starting to think about an action project that they might want to take. They already have an idea of what's going on in their community now. This response form is very much asset oriented. So we're not asking the kids to go out and look for evidence of dumping or, um, you know, negative parts of their community. We're asking them to go and look for these very kind of positive responses to climate change. Um, and we think in most of our communities in Howard County, they'll be able to find quite a few of these. And I so think yeah, go ahead, Anne. We're going to come back to that MIWI model, which is just, as you all know, is so helpful to getting the synthesis and to really get make sure that students are getting the science. And of course, we all love that action component. But we're going to take a, a deeper dive into the outdoor field experiences. We've created two general experiences, one to be done in their schoolyard and one to be done here at the Howard County Conservancy. So um, the first one we're gonna talk about is what we call schoolyard data discovery. There's three main stations. And what we've done is we've given all of the schools what I call an appetizer toolkit. It's a toolkit with enough materials to get them started. So we, we go to the school and we run these, these little stations for about half of a day. And then the idea to create this model of sustainability is that they will then take the tools 
and finish out the rest of the day. And if they want to keep them for a couple of days, they can. The following year, they can build into their budget to purchase a few more of these materials. And, and these items we're talking about are not, you know, we'll get into it, but they're, it's not a super big heavy lift. So um, we know, like we kind of knew from the start that we had to figure out, well, we can't service thousands and thousands of kids all the time every year. So this is one way that students can still get outside, um, collect some data that is directly connect, connected to the curriculum. And so it kind of goes both ways, right? Curriculum, field experience, curriculum, field experience. And we, we like that slide. It just creates a lot of um, space for discussion about these climate change topics. So let's talk about our, our first station. It's called Carbon Keepers. And um, this station is great because students go out into their schoolyard and they measure the DBH. And then based on that value, they use some, um, they correlate it to a graph. And that graph tells them how much carbon is being tree tags from Davy trees. I don't know if you all have ever seen those before, but they're, they're huge. They're like, I don't know, two and a half feet long and maybe 18 inches across. So um, in all these tree tags, you can calculate, you know, how many gallons of water are, are filtered through and, and it just kind of just tying this whole unit together with the value of trees. Um, trees are wealth, trees provide so many ecosystem services. Uh, for both the humans and the ecosystem at large. So in any case, you know, all the schools have trees, maybe not big ones, but they have trees. So that is super fun. Um, Best mentioned the microclimates and here they are using infrared thermometers to measure different various surfaces and then tracking the temperatures they find throughout the day. And the third station is called Water Wonders. And this is a great station like microclimates where they're using tools, you know, they're using um, a soil compaction tester to look at the different surfaces. Um, and basically the big question here is where does water go in your schoolyard? So they're pouring water on different surfaces. They're using a chronometer to look at the different angles in the schoolyard and even throwing, I'm sure you all have done this before, some tennis balls just to, you know, have a, develop a story, where does water go? And uh, we're about to jump into a little bit more about climate justice. And I did wanna ask where, um, where do you find your like professional learning on climate justice? Um, is it through a specific organization? Um, do you attend listening sessions, conferences, podcast or other? So I'm just curious as to um, what resources have you found? I know recently, um, Alexandra, I don't know that I have a link to the tree tags, but I'll, I'll look around, um, but it is Davy, Davy tree tags. Um, oh, okay, field work with indigenous practitioners, love it. Okay, um, Andrea, we've got 20 middle schools in Howard County this year were um, working with 13. So podcast and field work, Diego. Okay. Um, recently, I came across a great nonprofit called EcoRise out of Austin, Texas. And they but environmental justice. So that might be a place for you, for you to check out. And ologies, thanks, Katie. It's always just good to hear, you know, where people are getting their information, how they're gaining their knowledge. Um, last year, I don't know if you all have heard of this, but at our local library, they had a program that um, just went through the whole timeline of the history of environmental justice and the whole movement. And it was called not type this in, undesign the red line. And for me, it was extremely powerful just to create that underpinning for, for background information. So I do know that uh, it's on YouTube, Undesign the Red Line, and it um, and it is it's it's a exhibit that travels around the country. So you might be able to find it where you live. So let's get into um, this field trip that we created as well. So this is our second field work opportunity for students. 
and it is called Climate Expedition, the Journey to Solutions. And again, this field trip is really working well with the curriculum to touch on the same topics, to strengthen the relationship between what we're doing, and then it also elevates some of the topics as well. So we do a, about a two and a half hour experience with students, and we work with um, whole schools at the same time. Our largest group this spring will be hold on to your seats, 240 students at the same time. So uh, wish us luck. Uh, but we do a 30 minute climate justice station, a 30 minute hidden carbon cafe station, and then an hour long climate solutions hike. And so let's get into what the climate justice station actually looks like. Um, so I will, before I actually really get into it, I wanna say that, and Bess alluded to it, I don't know if you have found that climate justice is a delicate topic. And, you know, working with sixth graders, we had to kind of take where we were in our minds and bring it down a bit in regards to the content. So uh, initially we were talking about redlining and, you know, some of in our pilot last year, some of the kids came out to us before having that in the curriculum, just, you know, sometimes getting the timing right between teaching and, and the field trip. And so it was tricky. It was really tricky. So we really, we tweak the station a lot. And I, I think we'll continue to as well, but we're really looking at the two big questions here. Why are some communities disproportionately impacted by climate change and how can communities protect themselves and what can they do? So we really focused on the tree equity score and when it's all said and done, this station comes down to one thing, and it's human rights, human rights to having trees and green spaces. So we created two maps, different parts of Baltimore City, and students received different laminated cards. And the cards had different um, icons and values on them. And some of them are like a health index score, a temperature score, people in poverty and the amount of tree canopy coverage and all of these values we took from the tree equity score and you can find that same set of values where you live and so we handed them out to the students and then they had to pick which map the card matched with and that that um lent us to talking about the value of trees so, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the cooling of trees, what they provide, the, um, the peace of mind, the improvement of air quality, particularly in Baltimore City, and just lowering the air temperature. And so after we just kind of had a general discussion about all of this, we then moved into this hands-on activity where students have different parts of the city that they put on a map and they have a ruler and they have a bunch of trees. And so their job is to place a tree within 12 inches um, of every part of the city. And it's it's just really beautiful because what it comes down to is, you know, we really need um, students that can collaborate, that can think synergistically and work together. So um, we're really enjoying running this station and training our volunteers on how to run the station too. So um, that's another, I wouldn't say it's an obstacle, but it's something um, that just takes a little extra time to train volunteers on this topic and prepare them for what questions might arise. So we've been spending a lot of time working on um, training and, uh, and then even having our volunteers practice with us before they go out in the field and work with kids. Our next station is called the Hidden Carbon Cafe. It's a super fun station. And I have to say, uh, I got this idea from um, Elise and Bart at, a, at the Climate Change Institute in 2019. And we have since modified it, I think 50 times since then. But it's super fun because the students are learning about how to decrease the carbon footprint of their food from being grown in the ground to landing at their dinner plate. And so what they do in the station is they, uh, we have weighted the food based on carbon and they're um, using a scale out in the field and trying to build their lowest carbon meal. And as you can imagine, it brings so many great questions from the students. It's just, it's an awesome station. 
And um, I also included the industrial food system. So we actually walk the students through the steps. And, you know, it just brings up great ideas. Like we show them our community garden and we talk about um, like even international foods and what their carbon footprint is. So uh, a really, the stations are a really big hit. And then our final station for this field trip is called the Climate Solutions Hike. And this is about an hour long hike. It's less than a mile. The big win on this, honestly, is just getting the kids outside, like just getting them out and getting them moving. As you know, sometimes it just makes the biggest impact. And there's kind of two sides to this. Like one, we like to show all of the natural features. Um, we have a, an amazing series of beaver dams. You just, it's incredible. So it gives us an opportunity to talk about you know, beaver dams and the role of the beaver, um, you know, nature's best engineer. Um, we also have an opportunity to show the impact of um, major erosion in our local stream due to extreme weather. Um, we do that very same carbon sequestration activity on this hike with our champion trees. So to do it in a schoolyard is one thing with small trees, but to come out and check out huge trees, it's super exciting. And then we also have some other engagement activities peppered along the hike um, where they can roll these giant dice and decide um, on the face if that's a personal action or a community action. So we really begin having those conversations um, about what they can do, what they'd like to see done in their community. And, um, and one of the things that we do at the end is on that dry erase board is we talk about, you know, we want them to really begin to try well, what can I do? What can my community do about the impacts of climate change? And, and how can I love the land? What can I do there? So I want to give you um, just a couple of examples. We wrote in our grant that the focus for action project is gonna be everyday action. So last year we had three schools participate, as I mentioned. And um, so students put together some beautiful PSAs and I want to say that, I don't know if you recall, but last year for public school teachers was just a very, very challenging year for many reasons. And so this year we've really raised the, I don't know, raised the expectation, um, trying to really lift up and, and really spend some time on these action projects. And uh, so I wanted to give you some examples of how we've been training teachers. So um, let me know in the chat if you like salsa and what flavor, like what style. Do you like mild, medium, spicy? Okay, Jamie's into mild. Megan, spicy, medium, hot, 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 hot. Okay. Ooh, yum. Spicier, the better. Okay, well, ooh, I don't have pineapple, Andrea, but no onions. So the good news is, folks, I've got a flavor of salsa for each of you. So we we were working with teachers this summer, and we said, listen, if you like if you like a mild action project that have to do with trees, here we go. Um, we're going to go back, and we're actually going to look at the data that you collected about carbon sequestration. Your students will create an action plan based on the data. And then um, you could plant a class tree. You could plant one tree and that would be considered um, mild, all right? Well, let's say you wanna raise the spice. You wanna bring it up a little bit. We're gonna do all those things, but you know, perhaps the students would research um, climate resilient trees to plant. And then maybe, the, maybe the, the class would plant 10 trees that year. So that's medium. And then uh, let's people like, uh, Katie likes fire roasted salsa. Let, we're going to go for kind of a hot salsa. We're going to do all those things we did before, but this time we're going to plant 60 trees and it's going to take us all day. And uh, it's, it's a lot of work. It's that heavy work where we might bond with people. We're also at this point with such a large scale project is we're going to bring in some magic ingredients. We're going to ask our principal to come out and plant trees. We're going to ask community partners like Parks and Rec to come out and support us. And then we're going to ask our parents to get involved as well. But wait, is that enough? Do you want more? Do you want more? Hmm. You do. Okay, excellent. So we're going to go fuego now. We're going to do all those things. But this time, the following year, we're going to come back. We're going to monitor our trees. 
And then we're actually going to collect some data on the trees. We're going to measure the amount of carbon sequestration so that over time, that school can collect some longitudinal data. Woo, love it. Okay, so these are some climate action tips and tricks that we've learned over the past few years, just about implementing climate action projects. And the first one uh, with students is to, uh, brainstorming's great, and somehow we've got to get it down sometimes to something that's manageable given financials and time. So um, I've, we've just been finding that's just really important to kind of keep managing the goals because sometimes the, the goals will grow and then shrink and, and grow. And so just to repeat that kind of communication with the students about um, the actual expectations for the project. One second thing is, you know, our, our goal really as educators, particularly with this climate action emergency, is to build a community, build a community. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I know Bess is going to touch on that later. But we really want to develop this community of learners. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if I can get parents in planting trees, um, you're going to have these conversations at the dinner table. And I really think that you have made it as an educator when your students are talking about these topics at the dinner table. And don't be afraid to ask for help. There's a lot of help out there. Um, caring, we have found our volunteers to be so, so helpful doing everything from going to schools and meeting with teachers and supporting um, the purchase of trees, delivering materials, bringing shovels, really helping with those boots in the ground projects as well. And the one big thing I have learned in several years of doing this type of work is it is, it is really exciting to share the work in a public way, as simple as uh, a shout out on Twitter. And getting on Twitter, although I've gotten not so great lately, just because we're all so busy, but on Twitter, it seems just such an easy vehicle to make connections with different organizations and different professionals around that I found it really helps to build a network for doing the good work that we're doing. So um, I am curious, because I know we have a lot of very experienced educators and practitioners on the call. When you are working with teachers and other nonprofits, um, what are some tips that you have or that you have found that works to lift action projects off the ground? Ah. Uh. Leslie, yes, the key is we're really having that administration buy in. Absolutely. Elise, mm hmm. Yeah, having really solid partners, community partners. Yes. Oh, Linda, the grounds. It's tough sometimes. It's a lot of work to get these types of projects. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. We haven't lost trees, Victoria, so much. We have lost rain gardens before. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I agree, Erin. Okay, I was just curious to see what, what kind of, it sounds like we're all speaking the same language, quite honestly, about um, maybe some of the frustrations too with implementing. So we'll pass the microphone on to Bess. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about another uh, program that grew out of climate knowledge. Last year, when we ran um, our, our first pilot year with three schools, we decided um, to offer a little bit something extra to sixth grade students in those schools. We noticed that many of the kids already had an interest in climate change and they were looking for ways, they were looking for an outlet to express their feelings about climate change and to meet other like-minded students. So we started a program called the Climate Change Solutionists. Last year, we met with about seven kids from those three schools in the evenings, a handful of times at a local library. And we did some activities around climate change, some hands-on stuff. Um, it was really a, just an opportunity for those kids to talk to each other and to um, realize that there are people in the community that are their age that are also concerned about the climate change emergency. So this year, we opened up the Climate Change Solutionist Program to every sixth grader 
in Howard County across all 20 middle schools. So we had an application process. We were able to accept around 40 students and I had well over 100 students apply. So we had to narrow it down and I ended up accepting a couple of students from 17 middle schools in our county. And they have met once a month on Sundays this fall. So I call them my Sunday solutionists. And every month we do a different activity with them. So the first month they heard from Dr. Sarah Vaya, who gave them a climate change 101 talk. Um, another month in this first picture here, we had a bunch of uh, what I call change makers come, uh, local change makers that are doing work in the climate arena. And the kids went from table to table to learn about these local organizations. So here, um, one of our change makers, Erica Jones, is talking about Climate Victory Gardens. Another month, the students learned about native plants and the importance of native plants and uh, the threat of invasives as climate change is warming our environments. Um, so we had them go out onto our grounds and collect and sort native seeds that we are then going to cold stratify this winter and we'll be able to disperse those seeds come spring. Um, the students every month have also been working on designing their own sustainable community. So the third picture just shows this group getting started. We gave them a list of uh, criteria they had to include in their sustainable community. And the students will be presenting their final projects in February for a uh, reception we're holding for their parents, kind of an open house. The parents can come and see what the kids have been learning. Um, the other thing we did uh, Sunday was our actual, uh, was our last official solutionist, Sunday solutionist program for the school year. So one of our volunteers, our naturalists, offered to give the parents a hike, a, a guided hike. So I had about 20 parents sign up and go on a guided hike of our grounds on Sunday, most of whom had just never been here or they'd been here to drop their kid off and that was it. So it was just another great opportunity for us to take this project and just reach a few more people with it. And I was just so thrilled to see how many parents were actually interested in that. Um, so you're probably wondering how we get all of our teachers on board and comfortable teaching such a new topic. Well, we provide very rich professional learning and support for our teachers. And this is just a little bit of a timeline for this year. So you can see kind of what we do and what we offer. We begin recruiting our teachers in the springtime. And then over the summer, we offer a one day intensive that goes over the curriculum and some of the field experiences. We also participate in the new teacher orientation, which is held before the school year starts. Um, and we meet with new sixth grade science teachers new to our district to talk about the project. Then the teachers that have decided they wanna participate they attend a series of after school sessions and these are right after school ends we provide them dinner and we have different topics that we focus on. Um, and this is kind of where we are now so we've just wrapped up our uh, our final teacher professional development for this calendar year and the teachers will actually start teaching the curriculum in February. So in spring of 2023, we'll meet again as a cohort to begin collecting teacher feedback and to also celebrate their accomplishments. And then this coming summer, we plan to offer a week-long intensive um, and teachers who participate in that can receive continuing professional development credit through the Maryland State Department of Education. And teachers need those credits for their, um, for their recertification. So in addition, uh, we will schedule some occasional drop-in virtual meetings. Uh, those are just times that if teachers want to drop in to a Zoom call and ask some questions, Ann and I will be there uh, to meet with them. We also set up individual meetings with teachers to help plan their field trips specifically and their field experiences, um, their schoolyard field experiences. And... Um, Finally, we, we do come onto schools uh, to train teachers on how to support 
the climate expedition field trip. So Anne mentioned we have upwards of 200 kids that come at a time, over 200 kids that come at a time to our field trip here at the Conservancy. And although we have a lot of volunteers that come and help and we have our staff, it's not enough. So we do ask our teachers to come and help teach some of the stations. So we will go to schools and help train those teachers before they come out on the field trip. Uh, this is a quote from one of our pilot year teachers, our first year. So she's now, this is her second year in the project, Bonnie Hodder. She says, being involved in this program gives our students the knowledge and understanding of the processes that contribute to climate change, but also gives them the opportunity to think and collaborate creative solutions to advocate, to have some agency over their future. And I just think that's such a fabulous quote. Okay, um, so there are a few programs that came about some because of our um, climate knowledge program and some are already in the works. The Conservancy has been thinking about climate change for a long time now. And um, in addition to the NOAA BWET, we have created these other programs that uh, are listed here. So we offer a climate club, an after-school climate club at one of our local middle schools. And this middle school had over 40 applicants to our uh, climate solutionist program. We couldn't accept them all, so we brought a club to them. We also do some professional development uh, that's open to any teacher in the region around climate change. We do, um, we have a program called the Youth Climate Institute, and that is our uh, high school program. We offer community hikes. We've done some outreach to senior living communities, volunteer trainings, and we have this great book club that we ran this past summer uh, using the book here, uh, The Future We Choose, and we hope to do the book club again this coming year. So that, I know that was a lot of information, and. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Thank you so much, um, Bess and Anne. I'm gonna stop our recording.